So um, I will have a little short introduction for each of the panelists, uh, except Fiaka, uh, I already introduced you. And um, after we went through that, um, we'll have another round of a uh, poll for the audience and then start with our uh, open question and discussion for the panel. So um, I will start off with Carl Schulz from Angsa Robotics. Um, welcome, Carl. Um, shortly introducing you, uh, you did your Master of uh, Science in Robotics, Cognition and Intelligence at the Technical University uh, at Munich. <clears throat> and you are um, obviously one of the founders of Angsa Robotics, uh, which is developing an autonomous service robot for waste collection. Uh, I got to know you through our shared affiliation with the BSR, which is the Municipal Waste Management of Berlin. And there, I think you want to implement one of your prototypes. Um, what they told me at the BSR is um, when you make it in Berlin, you can make it in all of Germany. And I think this holds especially true for service robots in public. Um, Carl, a little question for you, maybe to, to have uh, some words of your own. Your profile in LinkedIn says robotics machine learning engineer, and I am enthusiastic for new applications of neural networks, AI, especially for sustainable purposes. Um, I guess the bachelor and masters at the TU Munich didn't really offer too much input on the subject of sustainability. So how and when did you get involved with this subject and especially in the combination with AI and robotics and how did the founding of Angsa um, cater towards that interest. Right. Um, thanks, Michel. Um, yeah, you're right. So sustainability was not part of my studies. Um, I think I didn't have any topic in that regard. Maybe it was possible to choose something like ethics in, in robotics, but uh, it wasn't very prominent. Um, but uh, I actually have to say that um, the sustainable aspect um, yeah, is somehow linked to two because all of my co-founders uh, and I, we met um, at a hackathon basically. And the theme we chose for our project was from the beginning was uh, doing something sustainable with robotics. And that's uh, actually how we met and how we, how we uh, got together. And then we searched for problems that we could solve with, with uh, mechatronical prototypes. And um, yeah, that was um, yeah the very beginning of the company, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that it's still one of our core values. Um, I'm pretty sure that it is. So currently, we're uh, growing a lot. We're um, trying to yeah find uh, new people for new roles. And in this process, we are also focusing that uh, like we we're very. Um, it's very important for us to communicate that this sustainable aspect is still one of our core values and that it's um, yeah, shared among the team. Um, yeah, so it sustainable, sustainability wasn't part of our studies, but it's actually the beginning um, of our cooperations as co-founders. Okay, very nice. I think later on we might have some more input, input from you of um, your everyday life in in this um, startup and the um, problems or also maybe the chances that you have by sub uh, sustainability <clears throat> okay thanks so far then i'll go over to the next um discussion um participant uh, francisca kirstein uh, you studied language and communication as i saw um and got in touch with uh, human robot human robot interaction through your master thesis um, now you are um, at the Blue Ocean Robotics, which is a robotic company in Denmark, and you're a scientific domain lead. Uh, also in 2021, I think you organized a workshop at the ERF, which is um, the European Robotics Forum, um, together with uh, Sharad Chandra Akale Devi, who's also part of the um, background organization team. And um, the title of that workshop was human robot collaboration and ai for sustainable production so in short you started at language and communication found your way to human robot interaction and now you're a scientific lead um, what role played sustainability sustainability along the way and 
at what point did you decide to incorporate that into your workplace since it wasn't really like there from the beginning i guess yeah thank you You're welcome <laughs> um i think just uh, like for Carl, it didn't play a big role during my studies yet i don't know maybe it was just not that much of a topic back then um, maybe just not for me uh, i think um it came up during my work and I think it, it came up mostly at maybe one of the ERFs you mentioned the workshop in 2021 maybe it was the one in 2020 or before um, where I think someone said to me uh, or in a workshop um, oh, the goal is to have like lots of robots in every household right uh, and then I was just thinking about all the electronic ways we've just heard it in, in the keynote of uh, the robots and the electricity they're going to use and um, just thinking I don't think anyone is is actually thinking about that and and preparing robots uh, to actually also um, become environmentally friendly and I think uh, of course the uh, environment aspects are just one part of the sustainability so uh, I think when we are developing robots we are definitely looking at are they sustainable in the organization that we develop them for uh, do they have a, a positive impact but there I was actually also mostly thinking of the environmental aspects of having lots of robots in one house household so uh, I think that's where it all started. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, we will see throughout the, the series of the webinar that there's more um, dimensions to sustainability than just the environmental one. Um, but that's mostly in the one that people come from. Um, I'm just uh, seeing that I'm not following the order of the pictures in the shared screen. Um, I was just following the order of the shared uh, pictures on the side. So um, I didn't forget, Tamash, I will come to you later. Um, for now, it's Patrick Courtney um, from Drone Matlabs and King's College London. Um, very well, welcome to you. Um, you started at the University of Manchester, as far as I found out, to finish your um, PhD in robotic engineering and molecular biology. Uh, you moved between workplaces and countries from research to development, business incubators and back, and have now over 20 years of industrial experience in technology development. So um, a lot of uh, not of knowledge there. Um, not only related to robotics, but also in the field of laboratory instruments, uh, as you told me, while working with institutions like uh, Capgemini, uh, Sila, or other lab, and um, now at EU Robotics. The latest project of you was or is um, Drachma. I think that's somehow related to healthcare logistics and drones. So as I comprehend from your latest projects, you are kind of a link between lab users, vendors, and new emerging technology, such as uh, robotics and AI, understanding the different perspectives, thanks to your comprehensive work experience, and knowing this particular use case for robotics and AI, which is in the laboratories, what would you say is or are the biggest concerns in relation to the subject of sustainability and what do you think needs to be done about it? Yeah, thank you for the introduction. So the, the laboratory is quite a, a, an enthusiastic adopter of robotics. But one thing that we've for developing new medicines, new, new doing new science and bringing new things to the world. But um, they're also a very inefficient places. They use a lot of energy. They use a lot of water, clean water. And when you automate the process with a robot, you can do things a thousand times faster than you could by hand and you produce a lot of waste. Um, it can be very wasteful even if you have an AI connected to it. So one of the concerns that's ar arisen in that world, and that means universities and pharmaceutical companies, is how wasteful that is and what can be done to improve things. The COVID pandemic actually has been a bit of a trigger when people could no longer get components because factories were shut. So it's really interesting to look at that world and see how quickly people have re realized that there is a, an important issue that hasn't been addressed and the way in which robots could possibly make it even worse or if we engage with new robot suppliers um, make it overcome it and address it quickly so 
in in labs uh, in also in 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 using robots like drones to deliver medicine huge benefits to mankind person kind but um also a, a great amount of waste that could be provided so for me it's a, a lot of it is about awareness and bringing people together and discussing it and this seminar series i'm delighted to have the opportunity to be part of it is a great place where we can start to discuss this and maybe provide some guidance or between us or create some guidance for startups, for engineers, for users of robots, and ask questions that uh, we don't normally ask. The informed consumer is a tremendously powerful uh, thing. So I'm hopefully, hoping that this will come out of the series. <laughs> yes, uh, I think that's uh, what we hope for. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Um, so the next um, participant is Tamas Heidegger from the Obuda University in Budapest. Um, you Hi, did everyone. your <laughs> hey, uh, you did your master's in electrical and biomedical engineering at the Budapest University, and you uh, kind of decided to stay there. And now you're an associate professor for, I think, over 10 years. Um, you're also the director of University Research and Innovation Center, as well as a working editor at the e, uh, IEEE Robotics and Automation Society for around eight years. Um, your main field of research is medical technologies, as I read from your profiles, uh, control, elaboration of surgical robots, image-guided therapy, and assistive devices. Um, I was going through your research profile, um, not all of it, I think that made days, um, but what I found was a lot about surgical robots, computer-aided surgery, <clears throat> um, everything that you would expect from your uh, resume. Um, but then also I found one title, which was about the SDGs and the role of robotics in that regard. Um, what role do you think will sustainability play in the future development and in the use of robotics and AI? Okay, so thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, personally, I'm convinced that uh, sustainability is about us all. So it's not just the future generation, it's the current generation as well. I hope to live long enough to, to see the effects, the positive effects of uh, sustainable measures and efforts that we are all making. So what, uh, what really brought me to this topic is uh, it started with uh, uh, ethics, actually. So I, I would really like to tap into the keynote speaker's uh, excellent uh, marks that robotics uh, as a mainstream and, and really a mega trend these days is touching on all of our rights. And through that, it's obvious that if we design engineering designers, of new robotic systems are willing to add value, we have to be very, very careful and diligent in choosing our technologies and platforms and validating those. And you know that involves a lot of ethics through the responsibility. And you can't really walk by that without looking into the sustainability aspects of it. So through these years, we have been designing medical systems where obviously there's a huge uh, responsibility involved. And through those, we have been looking for tools and measures how to, how to move forward. And I've been just uh, very positively reinforced by recent EU and other measures to elevate sustainability as a key metric, uh, whether your research is valuable for the society. This is not just enough to generate profit. It's definitely not enough just to generate academic impact. It's also important to generate a shadow, not a shadow, but kind of like a light ray for the future through sustainability. Thanks, yeah, that's... That's true. Um, so now, um, also joining us on this um, panel discussion, as I said before, is Fiaka. Um, I introduced you already, so I think we will go over to the next point, which is, uh, I think, another poll for the audience. Um, just a short one um, saying that uh, I think, Jackie, you can um, post it. Just in one sentence, what is your motivation for sustainability? So if you want to just put one sentence down or um, maybe two, three keywords, um, maybe why you came here and what in general is your motivation for sustainability there's so we can get a little feedback on, on that one. Um, who is finished with that already or in the meantime, please um, type in or raise your hand for any questions to the panel. I think now we should go towards um, a little more practical part and getting more information on what this webinar can maybe do for you or which uh, direction we will take, which questions and which answers 
you want to get from from us or from this um, panel today and what subjects do you want to um, talk about uh, i think we've been kind of um, theoretical so far so i'm gladly looking forward to some more practical um, personal experience maybe um, from our people from the industry um, i'll have to look at the chat i think i lost my okay there we go so i think yeah while we have the the question poll still open i will start with um maybe one question which is um, <clears throat> um more into the direction of personal experience um maybe i'll go with um carl for the beginning um but also feel free anybody to answer uh, or to add something to that question um in this more practical way, um, what do you think are the challenges related to sustainability when um, working in robotics? What is like the everyday or like one big obstacle that might hinder you or that might get in the way to really incorporate um, this topic? What do you think or what, what can you tell us from your experience? Um, so... Uh... I think there are a few positive um, things you get from working sustainably or doing a sustainable sustainable product product, which are, for example, um, getting access to some public funds, not a lot, but some, uh, getting motivated people on board because uh, it creates a bit more intrinsic motivation than um, yeah, just uh, paying more money or I don't know what. So I think. These are, if if I think from the top of my head, um, the things that you get positively from working sustainably or working with a sustainable product, um, and all of the rest, I would say, is negative. So, most of all, the economic aspect. So everything you do, which creates, which is more sustainable, in general, it's negative for business. For example, uh, using green energy is negative so because it's more expensive at least if it's really green energy not just some uh one one euro per megawatt hour um, um certificate from norway um or um choosing different technologies which are not the the cheapest one buying from um from uh, buying from countries where um the environment is more protected than for example in china etc so all of these have negative aspects on your on your uh, um on the business on your finance statement yeah. yeah um so this is obviously the biggest challenge and um yeah um yeah. i would say yeah that um francisca or patrick can you do you, do you agree with that statement from your experience through your work I agree that it's very challenging and it's very challenging when you develop robots. There are so many other things that you need to take care of and uh, making robots work out in the wild uh, that it's very difficult to have uh, sustainability as a priority or just on top of everything else that you need to think about. I think it's um, when you have an, another product uh, that is not that challenging to, to design and develop. And uh, I, I think you, you can more easy integrate the sustainability aspects in the design when you design and develop the robot. But um, just coming up with, with, with a good prototype is sometimes in robotics so challenging making that work uh, is satisfying all the customers all stakeholders that are involved uh, mostly uh, we've talked about it also if you add uh, aspects of for or or try to um, address sustainability um, that will change something in the business case and will either make the product more expensive uh, so the customer is, is not happy or won't be able to afford it. But I think also here things are changing because customers get more aware of that they need to also pay attention of sustainability. Um, 
it, it can, and that's why it can have positive uh, aspects as well in the long run. Um, but I think for startups, for SMEs, it's in, in robotics, it's, it's quite challenging to make it a priority. But of course, you can get specific investors, for example, you can uh, increase your customers with other customers that specifically uh, looking for companies incorporating sustainability. And I think that is increasing. So that's uh, becoming more and more customers are looking at that and more and more investors are investing in companies that take care uh, and have a, a sustainability strategy so I think we can um, we can we can feel the change but it's still challenging I definitely agree <laughs> yeah and Patrick you you're in direct contact with as I said uh, producers what what do you feel what do you hear yeah, so I, I tend to agree with that, but, but building on that last point, it, it does open up new possibilities. It does make you ask new questions. So new materials, you hear people make robots out of, out of wood, out of other materials, and not just plastic. People have opened up new research questions like, why do you want to make the, ro the robot as fast as possible? Is there a path plan that you can program in, which is more energy efficient? So it recycles the power. So, and then as, as, as uh, Francesca said, you talk to new investors, you talk to different people, different suppliers who maybe even didn't think of, of supplying the robot industry. So it opens up new questions. It's more challenging, it's hard work being first, but there's some really interesting robotics concepts coming out which are more sustainable and will be more sustainable. In the case of drones, we've had helicopters for a long time, but they're hugely inefficient and expensive and noisy and polluting. And then with these, the batteries that we've inherited from mobile phones and the new motors with new materials, which have their own questions, we can do things with small drones. We don't need a, a huge helicopter. So new possibilities and new questions and talking to new colleagues, it's always enriching, I think. Yeah. So maybe um, from there, um, Tamash, you, you're directly in this um, regard of, of research. Um, and Patrick just talked of the, the new technology which emerges or which can help um, cater towards that goal of sustainability. W what do you think research is able to contribute in in any way, <clears throat> be it uh, techno technological or maybe from from methodological that lo lo methodological point of view, this is a hard word. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, I believe uh, there are like two, three things altogether. So there are the, the aims, the tools, and then the practices. So the aims are clear here that, that we would like to make all our projects or our procedures more sustainable, resulting in more sustainable products, uh, whether it's a robot itself or a service that we provide through the robot or an application. And the tools are, are, are being generated. So I'm very happy to see more and more of these uh, sustainability platforms and frameworks, more of these uh, uh, different type of activities which help uh, designers to, to make sure that their products or their research is, be, is, is really taking into consideration sustainability approaches. Uh, but then, then comes the practices. So I think we have to educate people and this is where academia has a huge role. So if we introduce these tools to, to the future generation of engineers, uh, designers, inventors, roboticists, um, we can be sure that, you know, like maybe it's not a critical factor uh, about efficiency right now, but a few years from now, it should be considered as one of the key inputs and hopefully through like, making it uh, one of the scoring uh, components of, uh, of all the grants, the proposals, uh, making it part of the university rankings that is already happening. We can make sure that people will have general awareness regarding sustainability from a professional point of view. Yeah, so I think that already raises the question again that we had at the beginning with um, FIACRA, um, whether it's going to be incentivized by, um, as you said, funds for research or maybe some other subsidies. Um, I, I think I just read or just heard of this um, uh, article published recently by The Economist, who said um, that war and subsidies have turbocharged the green transition. And they were talking of a 10-year acceleration of this new um, energy and green transition. Um, maybe, Fiakra, do you think the current energy crisis will also help bring the focus on sustainability to uh, a subject as robotics as well? Do you think that can transfer? Um, yeah, I, I would imagine it would. I, I think the current energy crisis is focusing 
um, everybody's attention on all aspects of energy consumption and energy generation. So I, I don't see why robotics would be excluded from that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think just to echo and sort of touch on some of the things the other panelists have said, I think the idea of using new materials um, for robots, wood and um, bioplastics and things like that, I think that's very promising. I, I wonder if I could ask the other panelists who are, are obviously practically involved, is there any sort of group within the robotics industry who are lobbying for greener robotics to make greener robotics the standards in robotics? Um, do, do you know, would, would that even be a plausible scenario, do you think? Um, because obviously, to me, that seems if you could embed that as the minimum standard that robotics should be green, um, it would remove that competitive disadvantage that people were talking about in terms of trying to build sustainable robotics. Uh, and I was just wondering, is there anything like that in, in the industry? Like a transition from within, you mean? Yeah. Um, maybe I think, Tamas, since you, you're part of this IEEE, um, um working group i think you recently published this um article or this like what is seven thousand um something uh that is concerned with ethics uh, i think not not really environmental issues yeah, 7, but social issues seven thousand seven yeah that's what um exactly so so i triple started an initiative uh, called the ethically aligned design and it's, it's really bringing together people from all around the globe, uh, working on ethical frameworks for all particular engineering design aspects. So the, the overall framework is established in the, the 7,000, that's, that's 7,000 as, as the standard series of IEEE. So IEEE 7,000 is, was published, uh, I think it's already 2021, and you can access it actually uh, free. Normally standards, you have to pay a lot of money to, to look into, but all of these have become uh, open access uh, due to the IEEE funds. So you are able to look into those kind of approach, systematic design approaches recommended there for ethically aligned design. And that concept uh, through ontologies uh, has been driven through the robotics and uh, autonomous systems domain. So what we have been trying to do is to provide an ontology driven frame framework in which robotics people and robotic system designers can, uh, can apply those kind of ethical principles. And it doesn't really mean that, you know, it's not ethics in the philosophical sense that happens about accountability and the traceability uh, and transparency. Those are the key metrics. So we want to make sure that the engineering systems uh, then are uh, really supporting uh, these through these fractions uh, requirements that are actually already established. So if you look into medical devices, for example, where we have the strictest requirements, the MDR uh, in the EU, medical device regulation, uh, that really requires uh, manufacturers and companies to, to document their software down to the level where you are able to really understand who is responsible for an error if that causes patient harm. Mm -hmm. And from the env environmental side, um, I don't know, Patrick, you seem to have something for it. Uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's a good on the, on the design side. I think on the use side and the environmental side, one, I, I don't know that there is anything for robotics. The one organization I've got really got my eye on and I've had several discussions with is Mind Green Lab, which is a nonprofit set up to make the use of the laboratory more efficient and to make the owners of those and the people in that environment more proud and, and more, more confident of demanding better environmental uh, conditions. So it's universities, it's, it's uh, lab owners, and it's supplies into the industry. And that's grown from a very small activity to, to really quite a, uh, a well-established certification system, training system, awareness system, badging system. This worked very well. And my, my dream would be that we have something like My Green Robot, so that people mm -hmm. who design robots and deploy robots are able to put pressure and use their robots in a more effective, and environmentally sensitive way. Because once we deploy those robots, all those vacuum cleaners, I know I've had two and they've gone straight in the bin and I feel really bad that I've not been able to recycle them. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. We should be you know, making those demands. So My Green Robot would be... Uh, Maybe we come back in a couple of years' time. We find that mm -hmm. this thing is set up, and we're all part of it. Yeah, I mean that's that's something we want to talk about in this series. Oh, Francisca, I'm sorry, you want to yeah. add something? Yeah. To yeah. It? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, 
I think also part of why we uh, created this webinar series was to exchange with others because I, I don't think we really knew that there's anything out there specifically in robotics. So maybe this is the start of the My Green Robot and uh, in a few years we, <laughs> we'll have it because uh, um, people in this webinar, they are gotten interested or we, we're sharing ideas. So I think this is, is really also the place for it. I think um, I, I also don't know of anything specific for robotics. There's, of course, the normal standard certifications, ISO 14001 for environmental management that you can you can go through. Um, but I think it uh, it would be very helpful to um, to also have specific, maybe not standards, but guidelines and, and more how to's on um, uh, for robotics, because robotics is just uh, so different from from other products, even other electronic products. So mm -hmm. that would really be be helpful. <clears throat> yeah, I think when we're talking of uh, my green robot as a, as an idea or <clears throat> as a as a wish, as we formulated, um, the the question always stands. I think how can this be applied, or what does it need to be applicable? Um, Maybe uh, Carl again. You can you can say a few words to that. What would it need to look like, or what would it need for you to really apply it, or feel that it can be applicable in your in your use case? Um, I would say that the general problem is that often the like there is a cost for non-sustainable uh, like production or behavior. It's just that this cost is not paid by the ones who behave or produce uh, non-sustainable, but it's paid by the society. And um, this cost basically needs to be put on the people who, who don't uh, produce sustainably um, so that it is, in fact, uh, yeah, um, reflected in the, in the balance sheet. And uh, also there, I mean, there are measures um, for sustainability who are not very costly for the company, um, don't require a lot of change. I think these are, um, if they are not implemented, um, a problem of communication or of information. I think there, uh, a project like My Green Robot could help um, that we can implement things that um, are not super harmful for the business model. Um, on the other hand, drastic changes for example i mean on a big robot the i would say two core uh, non-sustainable aspects are the uh, material of the of the like the robot itself probably aluminium in most cases in our in our case at least and uh, the, the the battery and electronics and and there aren't any alternatives um for that at the moment so there needs to be some kind of incentive of, uh, yeah, using different materials, using different technology, um, because as of now, it's completely without alternative. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, maybe I can add to this uh, one question that was posed in the chat. Um, can you give your opinion on the political factors for sustainable robotics? I think you were going a bit towards the direction that it's... Um, maybe something from external that needs to change more like a political yeah. um advice yeah. or a political rule like in my eyes i would be actually really happy about a super high co2 um tax for example um mm -hmm. but it's obviously there uh, there are players or there are um, parties who, who are not in favor of that um or for example um for uh, a fee for using several like different chemicals which are very harmful for the, for the environment um but i think it's unfortunately not really in sight but all we can do is like uh, publicly say that we are in favor of it mm -hmm. <clears throat> maybe uh, the others have a comment on this political political question what is the the factors here or what what do you think needs to be done on a political level I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, there, there's so much, and I think as Carl said, obviously, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different factors going on politically. I think in terms of robots, one of the political aspects 
with the robotics revolution emerging will be um, people will be very concerned about their jobs being automated. Um, one way of perhaps softening that blow would be if robots are helping a, a green transition. Um, so if robots are highly polluting and also taking people's jobs, uh, there, there will be presumably a large political backlash. I think it would be advantageous um, for robot developers to say, well, you know, at least we're, we're green, we're helping move towards uh, a sustainable environment. I mean, it, it obviously won't be that simple in, in real politics, um, but I think it, it's something that robotics could use to its advantage if it's um, more sustainable than not. Um, and then I think within funding areas in terms of getting grants and so on, there are often ethics is becoming more important in technology. And uh, people are concerned, uh, as Thomas said, uh, about various aspects of accountability and privacy, certainly uh, data ethics. Um, I think it would be good to see environmental ethics being introduced in, into those discourses. Um, and that's something that uh, I was trying to touch on in my keynote. I think we, we need to discuss those. I think it would be better if it emerges out of the robotics industry and robotics developers um, rather than necessarily being imposed from above. Um, and I think when we think about the roles novel technologists have, um, they, they have quite a strong political role. So I think roboticists can be political actors uh, as much as political um, receivers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, we're nearing the end, so maybe one last uh, question or one last um, comment on, on the question. I think, Francisca, you unmuted yourself. Did you add, any, add anything to... Uh, earlier, I think, yeah. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> We can go back. Um, I think uh, it is difficult. I mean, ideally, it would be nice if consumers were asking for that and they could choose, but robotics is still such a niche market that sometimes you only have one robot for for solving one challenge and then customers can't really choose the more sustainable version and um, maybe it would help uh, for um, asking roboticists and robotic companies to think more about that uh, i think giving incentives in form from speaking about political, from uh, governments. I think we've talked, Cal mentioned also uh, funding. Um, there's a lot of funding, uh, I don't know, uh, for for other Euro European countries, but definitely in Denmark, there's a lot of funding right now, generally for SMEs, for startups to uh, calculate their footprint, to do life cycle analysis, to uh, do competence development for their employees to go into that direction. And I think those incentives, they already help a lot, even if it's not in form of restrictions or taxes or whatever, uh, it is a really good support for uh, also robotics companies to uh, learn more about it and try to, uh, to to implement that more in their work, even though it might be challenge more challenging than for other companies. Um, it, it's very good to uh, to know that. I think it starts with the, having the knowledge and, and being able to, to make a change. Yeah, thanks. Um... Anybody else has uh, to add anything to it or should we take this as the finishing uh, comment? Okay, thanks a lot, um, Francisca, for that. I think that's also what we try to achieve now to um, spread a bit the, the word. And um, I'm happy to have you all here in our panel discussion. So thanks a lot to all of you.